Hello, and thank you for joining us for tonight's missionary story. We're going to continue a story that we started last week called um, Nathan Finds New Life in Jerusalem. And this is taken from Bible Visuals Incorporated. And so let's jump in with our story. Last week, um, he and his family had just moved to Israel. I don't know if you remember that, but that's where we're going to pick up. Sleepily, Nathan pushed the curtain aside and looked out. His father saw him. Well, sleepyhead, he said. Did you finally get enough sleep? Get dressed and have some lunch with us. But I haven't had any breakfast. Don't worry, boy. We'll make up for that. The neighbors have been coming in and out all morning. Wait until you see all the gifts of food they brought. Welcome to Israel presents. But it's so early in the morning. I could use some more sleep. Smiling, his mother said, I know just how you feel, son, but never mind. You'll soon get used to that in the new time. Hurry and say your prayers and get dressed. Hurry, Nathan did. He skipped some of the usual morning prayers, but not the one all the men and boys said first thing each morning. I thank thee, God, that thou hast not made me a woman. <laughs> Even while they ate their noon meal, neighbors kept coming in with food and gifts for the newcomers from America. No one bothered to knock at the door. They walked right in, saying, Shalom, Shalom, introducing themselves to the new arrivals. This went on all day. By early evening, Nathan could see that his mother was weary. He was glad when he, it was suggested that bedtime for the traveler should be early. According to Nathan's brain watch, it was very, very early. But he was glad to be go behind the curtain to his room where his, when his parents went to theirs. Their room was simply another curtained off section of the same room. This made it a three-room apartment. The grandparents slept in the main part of the room. By the next day, Nathan and his parents had adjusted to Israeli time and ready to go sightseeing. The men put wide-brimmed hats over their skull caps. Nathan wore only his cap. The women tied babushka scarves over their heads. It didn't take long to see all of Mea Sharim. They walked along the very narrow sidewalk of the main street and turned down the little side street, stopping at markets and shops. Nathan could see how proud his grandfather was to introduce his family from America. Nathan noticed how they peered this way and that, looking for more children when he was introduced. But they were too polite to con and considerate of his mother's feelings to say anything about it. Nathan enjoyed their visit to the tiny shop owned by a rabbi. There were many beautiful handmade things to see, things which the rabbi hoped to sell. The rabbi's son was sitting at the bench making tiny little trinkets. One of them was made of silver wire from the form of the Torah. Nathan's father bought one of these and the tiny silver Star of David for his wife. Looking at the star, Nathan remembered the two triangles, the object lesson that the teacher in Chicago had used. When his father also bought himself a new prayer shawl, Nathan thought, nothing for me? Then he heard his father say, my son will soon be having his bar mitzvah. I think now is time to buy Flanctory's little box containing a portion of the Torah so that he can begin practicing and putting them on his arm and head. Touching Nathan's shoulder, he said, so soon a man my son will be. Nathan could see how pleased his grandfather was, for grandfather would be the one to teach him how to, to use the phylacteries. From the shop, they could see a synagogue at the end of the tiny street. There is always a synagogue handy when it is time for prayer in Mea Sharim, the rabbi said. We have many synagogues, and there is no excuse. It is time now. Shall we go? The rabbi locked up his shop. Together they walked to the synagogue. Inside the synagogue, the men and Nathan stood for the service. The woman went to a small room upstairs, closed off from the main auditorium. They could see the service downstairs through small holes cut in the wall. Nathan saw said his prayers hurriedly, trying to include those he had skipped the morning before. Even before the service was over, grandfather, grandmother said to Nathan's mother, Come, so we'll leave and go to the market. We don't tell the men. They can find us later. Not bothering one bit to be quiet, grandmother led the way down the stairs. When the men came out of the synagogue, Nathan was eager to make a request. Grandfather, he said, I'd like to see those apartments where you said we might live. Did you say they are not far from the Wailing Wall? If so, I'd like to stop there first and see the ruins of our Jewish temple and the only wall left standing where Jew Jews go to pray. You told me they pray there for the Messiah to come. They read the Torah before the wall and some cry and wail because their temple was destroyed so long ago. 
Did you hear your son? Grandfather asked Nathan's father. What a good mind and memory that boy has. It was long ago in America when I told him this. He remembers. He remembers. My little caddish remembers. He will remember his grandfather all his life. He will pray for me after I die. Tears ran down Grandfather's face as he said again, My little Kaddish. Walking to the end of the narrow street, Grandfather saw a taxi coming. He signaled the cab by making a hissing noise. The taxi stopped. Inside the taxi, Nathan's father exclaimed, We didn't see the woman after the service. They won't know where we're going. Settling back comfortably in the taxi, Grandfather grunted, They are only women. They'll know soon enough. They stopped at the Wailing Wall first. Grandfather watched Nathan's face closely. The serious, sorrowful expression he saw there pleased the old man. He pointed to the wall where worshippers were standing. Most were right up close to the wall, men on one side, women on the other, separated by a rope. Nathan noticed the men had more space than the women. Some were pounding their foreheads against the wall as they wailed and prayed. Others, standing farther away, were chanting from the Torah, swaying back and forth as they read. Some swayed more than others. These, Nathan observed, were dressed in the ultra-Orthodox clothing his grandfather wore. May I stand here while you and grandfather go to see the apartment? I'd like very much to stay and think, father. Let the boy stay, grandfather said. He will be safe here. We won't be gone long. Nathan could see his grandfather was pleased because he wanted to stay. It was a thoughtful boy who stood there alone, looking and listening. If it were true, if the Messiah had already come and wanted to be their savior, how sad that these Jews did not know. Would they all have to wait until he came again to know? As he, as he was standing there thinking, Nathan saw near a boy, a, a boy about his own age nearby, just turning to Nathan, and he said, Shalom. Smiling, the boy answered, speaking good English, I am an Arab. So I do not say shalom. Instead, I say Allah mach. God be with you. I like to be your friend. Thank you, Nathan said. Thank you. I, I sort of need a friend. I have just come from America, and I don't know anyone but my own family. Holding out his hand, he said, I'd like to be friends too. The Arab boy reached out and shook Nathan's hand. That is very kind of you, he said. I live in that house right over there. It doesn't look to have a, front, a door in front. This is because we made a back door when the Jews began coming to pray at the Wailing Wall. Now we use only the back door. We are not Jews, but we respect their religion. Tears came to Nathan's eyes. Again, he held out his hand. The Arab boy shook it, saying, My name is Ali Joseph. Mine is Nathan David. I'll look for you when I come again. I am going to have my bar mitzvah here. Will you come? Ali replied, that is very kind to you for to invite me, but those two men, are they coming for you? Oh yes, they are my father and grandfather. They've been looking at apartments near here. Maybe I shall live close by, then we could see each other often. I'd like that. But now we must hurry home. You see, my mother and grandmother don't know where we are. The Arab boy smiled again as he walked towards his house. There he turned and watched as Nathan greeted his father and grandfather at the gate, which led to the Wailing Wall. <clears throat> when Nathan, together with his father and grandfather, returned to Mea Sharim, grandmother scolded them for going to the Wailing Wall and the apartment hunting without telling her. So do you want your supper to be spoiled? Do you want we should worry ourselves sick? To all of the scolding, grandfather paid no attention. Nathan's father winked at his wife when grandmother was not looking his way. His wife gave a, sm a little smile. Gently, she said, You should have told us, you know. Nathan put his arm around his grandmother. Is it all right if I go outside for a while? I'll stay right in the court so you can call me when supper is ready. All right, so go ahead. You can't learn anything worse than your grandfather already teaches you. Go ahead, go ahead. Nathan hurried down the stairs. He wanted to be where he could think about what he had seen and heard at the Wailing Wall, and about the boy, Ali. Who is Ali's God? he wondered. Ali said, Allah mach, God be with you. So he did believe in God. When they got to know each other better, he would ask Ali about this. The crying of a child interrupted Nathan's thoughts. Looking up to the veranda, he saw a mother put her son on a stool. As the child sat there crying, a man cut off the boy's hair. He shaved the head after cutting, making it entirely bald. Well, not completely bald, Nathan noticed. There was a bit of hair remaining on the front of each ear. Nathan knew these were forelocks. 
His grandfather and many of the men in Meishari kept that part of the hair long, always long. Nathan felt sorry for the little boy and for the mother. She too was crying as she carefully picked up all the hair which had been cut off. She kept saying over and over, Don't cry, you are a big boy now. Three years old you are, and you wear your hair like a big boy, like a real Jew. So I guess I'm not a real Jew in Meisharim, Nathan thought. I wonder why they do this. There were so many, many things to learn. Would he ever understand them all? At supper, the table conversation was about the apartments the men had seen. So modern they are, Grandfather said. They use the sun to heat them. Aye! I think you will like them, my dear, Nathan's father told his wife, touching her hand. I did not make a decision, for you must see it, of course. Grandfather grunted. It was plain to be seen he was not pleased. Of course, of course, he said sarcastically. So why do you say, of course you must see it? So you should say, of course you will like it. You're a man, aren't you? Men make the decisions here. No one said a word, but it was obvious that Grandmother agreed with him. Supper over, Nathan's father took his wife's hand. Come, my dear, he said. If we hurry, we can look at those apartments before dark. As soon as his parents were gone, Grandfather said, Come, Nathan, it is time we begin having lessons. We shall start studying the Torah right now, eh? You must learn how to put your phylacteries on. Grandfather was going to enjoy this. Nathan wasn't sure about himself. Actually, he was a little disappointed because his father and mother went without him. Now that he wanted to look at the apartment, not that he wanted to look at the apartments, what he really wanted to see was Ali again. But he was settled down with his grandfather to study. Study I don't like, grandmother said. I'll go next door and see how Frida is. All day she has been sick. All day Jacob has been reading the Psalms. So loud he reads I can hear him in here. Over and over Nathan put on his phylacteries, wrapping the long narrow strips around his arm and forehead. Grandfather watched closely. There was a portion of the Torah inside the little box. It was as important as the mezuzah on the door. No boy could pass his bar mitzvah test unless he could put on the phylacteries exactly right. Finally, Grandfather said, A good lesson, a good pupil, and a good teacher, eh? Yes, Grandfather, a good teacher. You are a very good teacher. Nathan looked at his grandfather lo lovingly. Then I take a nap, just a little nap, sitting in the chair while you study the Torah. Then I'll ask you questions, Grandfather whispered. But don't tell your grandmother I take a nap when so soon we go to bed, eh? It's been a long day for your grandfather. I am very tired. But this I do not want your grandmother to know either. I won't tell grandfather. I won't tell anyone. When grandfather dozed off, Nathan's mind wandered from the study of the Torah to the things which the teacher in Chicago had told him. He could almost hear her voice saying, being born a Jew does not make one a real Jew, just as being born a Gentile does not make one a Christian. The Messiah came many years ago and walked in the streets of the Holy Land. There, outside Jerusalem, he died on a cross. This he did willingly. They could not have forced him if he had not chosen to do this. He wanted to die in our place because he loves us. He loves everyone in the world. He died to forgive our sins. He will do this if we believe in him, confess our sins, and ask him to be our Savior. God is one God, Nathan saw again in his mind, the triangle which he had used to explain how three could be one. Messiah is going to come again, and he will then be king and rule Israel. All will know him then. Those who refuse to believe in him when he came to earth the first time will be sorry forever and ever. Nathan felt again that same tug at his heart that he felt in Chicago when the teacher asked if anyone would receive the Lord Jesus Christ. He had wanted to do it then, but he could not disappoint Grandfather. The room grew dark, but Nathan did not notice. Grandfather was sound asleep in the chair, a handkerchief over his face. The room was perfectly quiet. Bowing his head until it touched the Torah, Nathan prayed. This time it was not a memorized prayer, but one spoken in his own words. O oh God, my God, and the God of my fathers, all of this is too much for me to understand. If it is true that you sent the Messiah to be the Savior, my Savior, please somehow let me know this so it is so. The Nathan, to Nathan's mind came the, again the words of the teacher as she read from her Bible. The natural man does not understand the things of the Spirit of God. You will never really understand everything, Nathan, not until you have the Holy Spirit in your heart to teach you. He is outside now and will not come in until you invite the Lord Jesus to be your Savior. Then the Holy Spirit 
one with the Savior, will be your teacher, and he will help you to understand these truths. Nathan rested his head on the Torah and sobbed until he fell asleep. When his parents got home, Father shook Nathan gently, saying, It is so my son studies, eh? Seeing Grandfather sleep in the chair, Nathan's father laughed and said, And it is so his, teachers, his teacher teaches, eh? Opening his eyes, Grandfather said, It was just a little nap. Now I ask you questions, Nathan. No, Grandfather, not tonight. Where is Grandmother? Coming in the door, Grandmother said, I am right here. So you missed me? Frida is better now, and Jacob can stop reading the psalm so loud. We have news for you, Nathan's father declared. So it's news you have. Well, tell us, tell us, tell us, tell us. How can I tell you when you are talking all the time, father asked laughingly. So now we are quiet. Tell us. All right, we have an apartment. We signed for one right near the wailing wall. In one week, we can move in. Nathan could see his father happy and excited as he said, Now we must buy furniture and a car. It is like starting a new life. I think I am going to be glad we came to Israel. Nathan and his grandfather looked at each other. And when we said goodbye that day in Chicago, we never thought this would happen, eh, Nathan? No, grandfather, we hoped only that I could be here for my bar mitzvah. The eager, pleased look on Nathan's face was not because they would get new furniture and a car, but because the apartment was near the Wailing Wall, close to Ali's home. In all the excitement of getting settled into their new home, Nathan's parents failed to notice that Grandfather was failing in health. He insisted on helping in many ways, as they thought he was weary from the extra work, as they all were. But it was more than this. Nathan remembered the night Grandfather took a nap shortly before bedtime, while Nathan studied the Torah. He remembered also that Grandfather did not want Grandmother to know this. Nathan felt sure Grandmother did know. She, he saw how she tried to spare her husband by doing many things herself, things which Grandfather usually did. Surprisingly, Grandfather did not object. The days that followed were filled with plans for the bar mitzvah. Often, Nathan walked to the wailing wall. He said he could study there better. He did study, but more often he talked to Lee. The boys were good friends now. Nathan's parents were pleased by this. Please, because Ali took Nathan to the YMCA, where they swam and played games together. One day, as they sat outside the YMCA, Ali said to Nathan, Nathan, I've been a coward. In answer to Nathan's surprised look, he added, Yes, I have. I have been afraid to tell you that I am a Christian, a Christian Arab. For a moment, Nathan was too surprised to speak. Then he said, I wish you had told me, Ali. I have been longing to talk to someone about something I heard in America. That is, that, that is, this man is the Messiah. I have many questions. Nathan, why ask questions? Instead, believe and trust. The Lord Jesus loves you. He died for you. He is waiting for you to receive him. If you believe he is the Son of God, put your trust in him. Nathan was silent for a moment. Then he told, he told Ali about bowing his head that night at his grandfather's house. I asked God somehow to let me know if the Messiah really did come to earth, if this, j the, if, this j if this man really died for my sins. Perhaps, my friend Nathan, God wants me to tell you how I came to believe in the Lord Jesus. Shall I tell you? Oh yes, please tell me. I have a sister who lives in Bethlehem. There are many Arabs there. My sister's husband became a Christian, but she would not. It is hard also for Arabs to believe, Nathan, though probably not as hard for Jews. Well, one day my sister became terribly sick. They took her to a hospital close to Bethlehem to die, we thought. But because they took such good care of her at the hospital, she got well. We wondered why the doctors and nurses, who are not Arabs, were so kind to us. We learned that Christians built the hospital because of their love for the people of this land. They were kind because they belonged to Jesus, your Messiah, Nathan, the one who died for the sins of the world. The hospital people told everyone about him. They explained that believing in Jesus is like crossing a bridge. When a person steps onto the bridge, he believes the bridge will hold him, keeping him from drowning in the river below. Just so, the person who believes in the Lord Jesus and puts his trust in him is safe forever and ever. When my sister heard that, she received the Lord Jesus. And if ever you go to Bethlehem, you'll meet many Arabs who trusted him as Savior while they were in that hospital. And wait till you see how much they love them, that missionary doctor and his wife. Standing, Elise said, please come with me. So he took Nathan 
to one side of the YMCA building and pointed to an inscription. You read Hebrew, Nathan. Read what it says. Nathan read, The Lord our God is one Lord. That's from your Torah, Ali said. Leading Nathan to the other side of the building, Ali pointed to another inscription. I'll read this to you, Nathan. It is in Arabic and comes from the Quran, a book which is sacred to the Arabs. It says, There is no God but God, Allah. Now we shall walk to the tower, Ali continued. See, on both sides it reads, I am the way. It is in Aramaic, the language Jesus used. He is the one who said those words. When my sister tried to make me understand about the Savior Jesus, I told her about these signs on the YMCA. See, I said, all religions are alike. One God is for all. The, Jew, the Jews believe one way. We Arabs believe another way. The Christians have their way. But all believe in God. They are all the same. I thought I was smart. But my sister got out her Bible. The whole Bible was with both Old and New Testaments. She said that I am the way is only a small part of what Jesus said. She insisted they ought to tell it like it is. From her Bible, she showed me exactly what Jesus said. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. See, Nathan, Jesus clearly said he is the only way to God, the only way to heaven. My sister told me that a good man like Jesus would not lie. Right then, I believed him to be the Son of God, and I put all my trust in him. Nathan thought about this. He too had been taught that Jesus is indeed a good man. Perhaps he really is the Messiah, Nathan thought. Maybe he is the only way to God in heaven. Ali said, Ah, come on, Nathan. You know you want to believe. Maybe someday, Ali, but not today. Let's go for a swim. Nathan's 13th birthday came on Sabbath. Because real Jews did not drive their cars on the Sabbath, his grandparents went to Nathan's home on Friday afternoon, hurrying to get there before the sun set and the Sabbath began. There they would stay until the bar mitzvah ceremonies were all over. It was a happy group that ate the Sabbath Eve meal together. They sat and talked for a long time. Then Grandfather said, So you can say it's an old man I am getting to be. All right, I'm an old man. Old men like to go to bed early. And this old man wants to feel good tomorrow, and great tomorrow it will be, eh, Nathan? Yes, Grandfather, a great day. Shall I show you once more how I can put on my phylacteries? All right, all right, so show me once more. Nathan handled the phylacteries carefully. Everyone watched quietly as he bound the narrow straps first around his finger, then up his left arm elbow, above the elbow, right where the small case was fastened. The case contained small pieces of parchment on which were written parts of the Torah. Then Nathan showed them he could put it on his head. Unwinding carefully, Nathan put the phylacteries away. He smiled and bowed before his grandfather. If I do well tomorrow, it will be because I have a good teacher. Shh, grandfather said. Do you want I should cry? As he went off to the bed, the family could see he was indeed crying. Sabbath morning was clear and sunny. Nathan knew he was fortunate to be able to have his bar mitzvah at the Wailing Wall. Most of the Jews in America had the ceremony in a synagogue. Usually, only the wealthy could go to Jerusalem. Nathan and all his family walked slowly to the Wailing Wall. It wasn't easy for Grandfather, but he walked, proudly, wearing his special hat, its edge covered with fuzzy fur. Nathan's father wore a plain black hat. Nathan's head, covered was, Nathan's head covering was a blue yarmulke. The rabbi was waiting for them. Many Jews were already praying, most of them standing close to the wall. The rabbi took Nathan and his father and grandfather away from the wall, close to the elevation where the woman stood to watch and listen. Unrolling a large scroll, the rabbi read from the Torah. Then he asked Nathan questions, all of which Nathan answered quickly and correctly. Next came the test of binding the phylacteries. Nathan's hand shook a little bit, but he passed this test also. A prayer shawl was placed around Nathan's shoulders as he stood with bowed head. The rabbi rewound the scroll, kissed it, and placed it in the beautiful case. Kissed the case and Nathan. The boy was declared to be Nathan, a man. Some woman who had been praying at their side of the wailing wall, seeing the bar mitzvah in progress, joined Nathan's mother and grandmother. Just as soon as the bar mitzvah ceremony was over, they all threw candy on Nathan. He waved and smiled as he picked up every piece. It was then that he saw Elise standing nearby, watching soberly. But the ceremony was not over until after the social time at the home. 
Friends and neighbors had been invited. They brought gifts and there was little cakes for all. But the most important part of the celebration was the speech which Nathan had prepared. But the, no the noisy group became quiet when he stood to speak. I wish to thank my parents and my grandparents for all the love and care that they have given me all my life, he began. Now that I am a man, I know I am responsible for myself. I hope that someday I shall be able to repay my parents and my grandparents for all that they have done for me. Nathan's voice trembled as he said, Since I may now ask whatever questions I care to, I'd like to ask a few. Nathan looked for the rabbi for consent. The rabbi nodded his head. I must tell you my questions are about some things written in the Tenic. Not all are from the Torah which God gave Moses, nor from the Talmud which men wrote. Yet they are from writings written in the Tenic. Everyone strained to listen. This was a strange boy, but every Jew had a right to ask questions. This boy really thinks, the rabbi thought, but what does he think? Trembling but standing straight, Nathan began quoting verses from the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. The men became restless. Some tried to interrupt, but the rabbi held up his hand for silence. Nathan said in a low voice, My first question is this. Was I quoting from the Tenic? Grandfather shouted, No, no, Rabbi, stop him. He is quoting from the Goyim's Bible, their New Testament. Rabbi, this is not in our Tenic. Yes, it is in our Tenic, the rabbi answered quietly, but those verses refer to Israel. They do not refer to the Messiah as the Goyim teach. Bravely, Nathan said, And so this, he was wounded for our transgressions, and all like all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. You think these mean Israel? To me this seems impossible. Excuse me if I offend. I have more questions. The rabbi tossed his head angrily. We do not have a real Jew who has become a man today. We have one who has been spoiled by what some goyim have told him. So saying, the rabbi stomped out of the house. After the rabbi angrily left the celebration for Nathan's bar mitzvah, the room was strangely quiet for a few moments. Then Nathan's grandfather spoke. My grandson only asked the question, why was the rabbi angry? The other men only shrugged their shoulders, showing they had no answer. It was at that moment Nathan knew he was a believer in Jesus. He was his, he was his Messiah, his Savior. Still standing straight and tall, he looked straight ahead as he spoke. He could not bear to see the look he knew he would would come from his father, the faces of his parents and his grandparents. But speak he must. I'm sorry the rabbi left, he said. But, but please, my friends, when our prophet Isaiah spoke, I believe he was speaking of this man who claimed to be our Messiah. How could it be otherwise? Please do not judge me until you have carefully read this portion of the Tenet. I have been thinking about this for a long time, and I believe our Messiah came many years ago and suffered, just as Isaiah foretold. He died taking our sins, my sins, upon himself. He wants us to put our trust in him, and I have done that. There were agitated murmurs among the group. Please, Nathan said, may I finish? I have not said our Messiah will not come. Like you, I believe he will surely come, that he will appear right here in our beloved land of Israel. But that will be the second time he comes. He came once as a suffering Messiah, as Isaiah told beforehand. That first time, he, the Lamb of God, was our sacrifice for sin. But he will come again. Then he will be our king. I have finished. Enjoy your food. I thank you for coming to my bar mitzvah. I thank you for your gifts. I love you all. There was an absolute silence in the room as Nathan walked outside. A dark-eyed Arab boy, who had been standing in the shadows listening to everything, fell in step with Nathan. He said not a word. There was no need. Nathan was glad for him. Just to have him walk beside him was good. Back in the home, the guests tried to appear happy. They told Nathan's parents what a smart boy they had. He will be a rabbi maybe someday. He uses his brain. He is a Talmud Kokum, a wise student, a scholar. To Nathan's grandfather, they said nothing. Sadly, they looked at the old man slumped in a chair. One at a time, they left the celebration. The sun had gone down and the Sabbath was over when Nathan finally returned home. He did not know what to expect when he walked in the door. Nathan felt a great sadness in his heart, knowing he had disappointed his parents and grandparents. But alongside the sadness, there was a great peace and happiness. If only those he loved 
could understand and receive Jesus as their Savior, especially did he long for his grandfather to receive the Messiah. Somehow he felt grandfather would not be with them much longer. The house was dark, then Nathan saw a light in the bedroom his grandparents were using. Stepping softly, he went in. His grandfather was lying on the bed, his eyes closed. His grandmother frowned at Nathan and motioned for him to get out. He turned, looking pleadingly toward his parents as he left the room. In the living room, he sat alone, his head bowed. In a few moments, Nathan felt his father's hand on his head. Looking up, he asked, Is, is, he, is he dead, father? No, my son, but he is a very sick man. The doctor says it is his heart. We are waiting now for the ambulance. There it comes now. From his stretcher, Grandfather saw Nathan. I don't know you, he sneered. I have no grandson. Grandfather turned his head away when Nathan leaned over him. Tears were in that boy's eyes as he said, Grandfather, you always called me a Kaddish. I shall pray for you to get well. This is a Kaddish can do also. His grandmother flashed angrily look, angry looks at Nathan as she followed Grandfather to the ambulance. She would not leave her husband. Nathan was already praying for his grandfather. He leaned quickly. He learned quickly that God hears the prayers from a heart, even though words are not spoken. Nathan sat with his parents late into the night after his grandfather had been taken to the hospital. For a long time, no one spoke. Nathan expected his father would say, at any moment, I have no son. To us, you are dead. You must leave this house. We never want to see you again. Finally, his father said, Nathan? Yes, father. I want you to know that you are still my son, a son I am proud of. The surprise, the surprise at not being disowned was too much for Nathan after the excitement of the day. He fell, sobbing, burying his head in his father's lap. Father waited until Nathan was calm again before he said, I do not mean that I approve of what you said about believing in this man the Gentiles call the Messiah, but I honor and respect you for your courage. You were brave to let your belief be made known. I cannot deny that you gave us all something to think about. I do not speak for your grandparents, but as for your mother and me, you are still the son we love. You do think as your grandfather so often told us you do. We feel you must have a good education and we want you to know that this is your home as long as you wish to live here. Now go to bed, son, and sleep. Grandfather will be well cared for, and there is nothing you can do. So sleep, my son, sleep. What a man you have become. Nathan's mother had been crying softly all the time. On his way to his room, Nathan stopped to kiss her cheek. What son ever had such wonderful, understanding parents, he wondered. There was no need for his father to tell him to sleep. Exhausted, he fell asleep quickly. Soon after his bar mitzvah, it was time for Nathan to enroll in his school in Jerusalem. His father decided to enter him in a religious school for half a day and in the public school for half a day. Nathan was delighted with this arrangement, for in a public school he would be in classes with a lead. This made them both happy. It was a surprise to Nathan and to his parents when they discovered that in the Jewish religious school there were lessons on the life of Jesus and the growth of Christianity. How else shall we give them a complete education, the teachers asked, and although the Orthodox Jews were angry about it, the students learned of Jesus Christ who lived in their land long, long ago. Nathan yearned to read more about the life of Jesus than was, was, was printed in his 35-page textbook. Ali had a New Testament which he gladly shared with Nathan, but Nathan wanted one of his own. He began saving his allowance and one day bought one in an Arab bookstore. He pretended not to see the strange looks from the owner of the store. Many times Ali and Nathan sat together in the shade of the olive tree. Few people passed that way, and the boys had good times reading God's word and asking each other questions. The night before Jesus died, Ali said once, he prayed under the olive trees. Would you like to see that garden sometime, Nathan? Nathan would indeed. So the boys explored many places mentioned in the New Testament. What great times they had. The school teacher often wondered how Nathan seemed to know so much about the life of Jesus. At home, Nathan did not hide his New Testament. There were times he felt certain his father had been reading it. Nathan was also a good scholar in the study of the Talmud, which was considered part of the Tenach. It made him think, but he knew that these were man-made rules for daily living. Yet it was fun to try and solve some of the problems. The months of school passed happily for Nathan. Alas, he did have one sadness. Grandfather had been home, had been home from the hospital for some time and was gradually getting stronger. He refused, however, to allow Nathan to visit him and would not visit Nathan's home. 
Not until you disown your son do I come, he told Nathan's father repeatedly. This Nathan's father refused to do. And then the day before Passover celebration, Nathan's family received this message. Grandfather is very ill. Come at once. Nathan begged to go with his parents. He longed to see his grandfather. Son, his father said, the people in Masharim who know you've converted to Christianity may stone you. Yes, father, I know, but I believe God can protect me. Please may I go? Parking their car at the corner, Nathan's father led the way down the narrow street, turning into the court where his grandparents lived. The moment their grandparents' neighbors saw them, they shouted, Traitors! Turncoats! The boy is a Christian and his parents haven't put him out! Picking up stones, they hurled them, screaming all the while. Nathan's father pushed his wife and son ahead of him. Hurry! Run! he ordered. Even though they ran as fast as they could, some of the stones hit them. Nathan was glad the door of his grandparents' home was never locked. They ducked inside quickly. Grandmother was beside the bed where grandfather lay. Although she glared at Nathan, she did not keep him from speaking to his grandfather. Grandfather, Nathan said, this is your Kaddish. I love you, Grandfather. Please say you forgive me. Grandfather opened his eyes. Straining to speak, he asked, you are sorry you said you are a Christian? No, Grandfather. I am sorry because I had to hurt you. Grandfather, the Messiah loves you. It's like the prophet Isaiah wrote, you and I and all of us are like sheep which have gone astray. We have turned every one of us to our own way, but the Lord God has laid on us the the, the has laid on the Lord Jesus, the Messiah, the sins of us all. He died for us, for you, Grandfather, and he proved he is God's anointed one by rising from the dead. Do you understand, Grandfather? He died for, for you. Nathan's grandfather raised his head a little bit and spat on the floor. This, he said, is what I think of that. Turning his head to the wall, he died. When Nathan's grandmother saw her husband was dead, she said, Blessed be the true judge. Then she added, He died the day before Passover. He will have a good entrance into his future world. She began to cry and wail. Only once did she stop for a moment to say to her daughter-in-law, So why don't you wail? Cry, I see you, but wailing I do not hear. Nathan thought, My mother is never noisy. Meanwhile, Nathan's father went out to tell the neighbors and to get with the burial, the burial society. The body would have to be buried before sundown. Nathan, neighbors came to ask pardon of the dead man for any wrong they might have done to him and stayed to weep and wail. When they were ready to carry grandfather to the house of the graves for burial, a large number of friends and neighbors walked behind the body. This is good, grandmother said. He will have just as many angels to greet him as the souls of people who walk. Because Nathan's grandfather died the day before Passover, the family could not have the usual seven day of seven days of mourning. Every Jew was expected to celebrate Passover. At the time of Passover, eight days were set aside for a happy celebration of the day long ago when the Jews who were slaves in Egypt were set free to return to their own land. The two days of Passover, every Orthodox Jew family had the cedar meal. Grandmother's neighbors invited the family to eat Passover with them in their apartment. Nathan's father accepted the invitation, thanking them for their kindness. Nathan and his family sat quietly at the neighbor's cedar table. The ceremony began when the mother recited a blessing while lighting candles. The cedar plate was set before the head of the family. In its six compartments were six elements to remind them of the bitter lives of the slavery their ancestors lived in Egypt. The flat matzo bread was also used at the Passover meal, reminding them of their ancestors left Egypt hurriedly. There was no time to let the bread rise before baking. During the meal, they sang a song of praise to God. The father read 22 verses, thanking God for all the blessings he had given them. Each verse mentioned one blessing. The family joined in singing the chorus after each verse. The chorus said, it, one blessing, would have been enough. When the ceremony was over, the family sang portions of Psalm 118. Nathan and his family had a little appetite for the full course meal, which was served during the ceremony. Their hearts were sad. They missed grandfather. The neighbors understood and was not offended when they left the celebration early and returned to grandmother's. Nathan's mother had avoided looking at Nathan all evening. She would not speak to him. She w at least she did not refuse to eat Passover with me, Nathan thought. This was encouraging. In time, perhaps, maybe she might forgive him. I do hope so, he wished. After grandmother went to bed, Nathan and his parents sat quietly for a while. Finally, Nathan's father spoke. My son, did you know I have been reading your New Testament? I thought so, Father, and I'm glad, really glad. Then let's read some of it together before we go to sleep. What do you say, son? Nathan did not 
need to answer, he whipped out his New Testament out of his pocket and placed it in his father's hands almost before his father stopped talking. Nathan's mother moved close to her husband. Do you mind if I listen too? Nathan was overflowing with joy. Somehow he managed to sit quietly and say nothing, but he could not keep the happiness from shining out of his dark eyes. Father began, I've been reading in the book called John. To let, tonight I'd like to read again part of the first chapter. Listen carefully, please. I want to see if this son of ours has asked the same questions I have been asking myself at the Passover celebration. Nathan's father read quietly through, the verse, through verse 34. When he finished, he asked, Well, son, do these verses cause you to question anything in our Passover celebration? Yes, sir, they really do. And I almost let my question pop right out of my mouth at the neighbor's cedar feast. Instead, I just asked myself, Why don't we have a lamb at our feast as God commanded the Jews that first Passover night in Egypt? Nathan, I've asked the same thing of many during my lifetime. Always the answer has been the same. The lamb would have to be slain in the temple, and now we have no temple. But in these verses I have read from the New Testament, John, who was a Jew, said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Nathan thought for a moment before saying, It also says the same Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Maybe that's the reason God allowed the temple to be destroyed. Maybe so, Father said, rubbing his chin nervously, then shifting his eyes back and forth between the son and his wife, he announced, Tonight I have come to believe that Jesus is indeed the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, my sin included. I have received him as my Savior, my Messiah. Nathan's mother glanced toward the curtain behind which grandmother was sleeping. Shh, shh, she commanded. We don't want to bring more sorrow to her. In a whisper, she added happily, I, too, am a Christian, and I have been ever since your bar mitzvah, Nathan, when you stood so bravely before our friends and said you had placed your trust in Jesus as the Messiah Savior, I, too, believed. I wasn't brave like you, Nathan. I've told no one until now. Nathan let tears run down his over his broad smile. He seemed again to hear his grandfather say, A real Jew is not ashamed of tears. Each one in the family laughed and cried together. No one wanted to go to bed. Their newfound life in Christ filled their hearts with joy, but there was sorrow too because grandfather had rejected Jesus, the Savior. Let me now, let me read some more of this book called John, father said huskily. I like the third chapter which tells of the Jewish leader Nicodemus who came to Jesus one night. Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Almost 1,500 years before the Lord Jesus said those words, our Jewish people had spoken against God. For punishment, God sent fiery serpents that bit them, causing many, many Israelis to die. However, when the people finally admitted their sin, God told Moses to make a brass serpent and set it up on a pole. Whoever was bitten by a serpent was commanded to look up to the brass serpent. When he did so, he lived. Away back then, God was giving us a preview of the death of Christ on the cross, because all three of us have looked to him, we too have life, eternal life. Isn't it wonderful, Nathan began, that God doesn't say we must understand? We simply have to believe in his son. I remember the day Ali told me, Nathan, why don't you stop asking questions? Instead, believe, trust. Can we go back to our house soon, Father? I can't wait to tell Ali the good news. Perhaps tomorrow, son, perhaps tomorrow. But we must try to persuade your grandmother to come with us, and I think she will. As soon as Nathan got home, he went to see Ali. Could we go for a walk, Ali? He asked. I have something important to tell you. They hurried to their favorite olive tree where Nathan told first the good news about his parents. They laughed together. Then he told the sad news about his, his grandfather, and Ali shared his sorrow. It's great to have you for a friend, Ali. We'll probably have many hard things to face as we grow older. We'll probably have happy things, too. But we'll stay together and always be friends, won't we? We sure will, Nathan. We'll be friends always. At home that night, Nathan wrote a long letter to the teacher in Chicago. Will she read this to the happy day clubbers, he wondered? Sure she will. I bet you. And Nathan was right. One Friday, as the boys and girls at the happy day club ran into her home, they could see something had made the teacher extra special happy. In her hand, she held a letter with a foreign postmark. When they were settled and quiet, she began, I can scarcely wait to share with you a letter I received in the mail this week. It's from the Middle East. Can you guess from whom? The children exchanged puzzled glances. No one could guess. 
Let me give you a hint. It's from a boy from, for whom we've been praying each week at club. Hands flew up then. The Jewish boy who went to Jerusalem. The Jewish boy, they shouted. Yes, the letter is from the Jewish boy, Nathan. He came to club only twice, but I had some private talks with him. Then his family moved to Israel, where the Jews now have a country of their own. Listen as I read Nathan's letter, please. Dear teacher in Chicago, Shalom. I have been living here in Israel for many months now. I like it a lot. We live in old Jerusalem, but our apartment is modern. It is heated by the sun. We are not far from the west wall of the temple, which is still standing partly, that is. Most of the temple was destroyed many years ago. This wall is called the Wailing Wall because it is here that many Jews come to weep and pray. Gentiles come too, but it is the Jews who wail and pray and read their Torah. They weep because they no longer have a temple. This first time I went to the Wailing Wall, I met an Arab boy. We are now really good friends. His name is Ali Joseph, and he is a Christian. He believes that Jesus is as his Savior. My grandparents live in a place called Mera Sharim, where the Jews are very strict all about the laws that they think the Jewish people should keep. Only now there is only my grandmother. My grandfather died not very long ago, just the day before Passover. The real reason I want to write to you today is to tell you that my friend Ali helped me to believe in Jesus as my Savior and Messiah. He helped, but teacher, you were the one who began it all. Many times I think of you and I thank God because you talked to me. We have a nice star of David hanging on our wall. Every time I look at it, I remember what you taught me about God, the three in one. Perhaps the boys and girls in the club have been praying for me. Please tell them thank you. But ask them, please, to get busy and tell all their Jewish friends that Jesus is the Messiah. I wish I had believed in him sooner, and I might have if someone had spoken to me sooner. And if I had known sooner, then I might have been able to help my grandfather to believe. He died without believing. It was very sad. I want to try and help my grandmother to believe. Will you pray for this, please? Perhaps you wonder why I do not ask you to pray that my mother and father will believe. That's because they both believe already. My father wasn't mean to me when I told him I had become a Christian believer. He is a good father, but my grandmother, grandfather was very angry. My mother was always beautiful, and now she is a Christian. She is even more beautiful. I think, I'm thankful to God for bringing us here to Jerusalem because I have found new life here. My everyday life is new and good, but best of all, the new spiritual life I have found in our Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe someday, teacher, you will come to Jerusalem. I hope so. Please visit me and my parents. We shall all welcome you. And now, until Messiah returns, Shalom. Your friend, Nathan. Wow, that's quite a story. Nathan, who did not believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and then when he moved to Jerusalem, he did. It's quite sad to hear about his grandfather, and even his grandmother, who does not believe. Maybe you know some people who do not believe in Jesus as their Savior. They may not be Jews, they may be other people or people that believe in something else besides what us Christians believe in, in the truth of the Bible and the gospel. And it, as Nathan says in his letter to the teacher, it is important to tell those people. And that's what missionaries do. This story about Nathan, I hope, has helped you to think about what do you believe? And do you know people that don't believe? And should you tell them? Maybe it's family, maybe it's friends, people at school or teachers. It is important that others know about Jesus being our Savior as well. Thank you again for listening and joining us for today's lesson. Let us pray right now. Lord God, I thank you for this lesson about Nathan. Um, we thank you that we can hear stories like this and it can encourage us to tell others as well. I pray that each one listening would decide whether they really do believe in what Nathan found to believe as well. We pray for Arabic Bible Outreach. Um, they uh, witness to people like the boy Ali in her story. And I pray that um, more people who do not believe the same as we do, that through this Arabic Bible Outreach and Mike Hodge, who's a missionary for them, they will believe as well. God, I pray that um, more would come to understand the Bible and what it really says, and know that Jesus did come and he died for our sins and he rose again. Thank you, Lord, that you allowed that to happen, that we could have eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. Alive, alive, alive forevermore. My Jesus.